When I was very young, I actually was saddest about broken things. And so, with the great sense of responsibility that all young kids have, I made a vow that I'd find a way to fix it, or even stop it happening in the first place. And so first I thought that if I could only combine the two greatest opposites in my life and make a language and share this with the people that I loved, that they'd stop fighting. <laughs> and later, when I got to school, I wished I had a map. I wished someone would give me a map that put everything together and so people would stop saying that poetry is separate from cosmology or history is separate from geology or religion is separate from everything else. <laughs> so. My life was defined by a quest for a unifying theory, uh, for this panacea that would make my world unbroken. And today I'd like to show you one of the answers that I found. I call it the innovation map. Actually, this is a summary of a proof that we made in 2006 at the University of Bath where we were able to show that there's seven common steps to the way that all human beings think when they make, create, or produce, or innovate any kind of stuff. What I mean by that is that this seems to be a fundamental pattern that's built into us. Uh, we act this way no matter what we do. It doesn't matter if we're fashion designers, aerospace designers, if we were Aristotle or a modern Hollywood screenwriter. This is built into us. Mm. So, we're automatically primed to follow these steps, but the funny thing is, no one's mindful of this fact. So when I coach Fortune 500s, we find that becoming mindful of this helps them do what they already do faster and better. And when I teach in emerging markets, what I tell them is that if they can put this to work in their own life, then they'll be ahead of 90% of Western innovators. I said there's seven steps, there's also seven contradictions. Um, and so, these come together in this, in this crazy story of mine and when I say to be ahead of Western innovators I also don't mean to imply that it's some kind of race because what people very quickly find when they work with me is that innovation is never a one-shot overnight disruptive success just like that doesn't happen. What it actually is is a process of learning. It's a process of learning about what we really want and who we really are when we try to make a difference in the world. It's a process of splitting the world scientifically apart and then religiously combining it back together, which I think is what all of creation does. So let me show you the steps. We start on the left-hand side of the map where space is starting to open up. Um, it's starting to open up because we are at the developmental stage of a three or four-year-old who is just becoming aware of the world around them. Um, we are just starting to notice there's other people. And actually, research shows that at this point in our lives, um, our very first response to others is also to be generous, to want to share. And I found out in Buddhism and in medieval England as well, the concept of generosity and genius are actually related. And they're both related to the concept of noble birth, which I always interpret as meaning that when we start a journey, an adventure, knowing that we have enough for ourselves already and nothing to lose, then we also coincidentally develop a wish to help others. And, um, and the coincident ability <laughs> to do it. Anyway, it's a crucially important sensitivity for innovators to have. Um, because historical data also shows that it's not even possible to create on a grand scale if we only want to save our own skin. It's, um, it's not possible if we just do some calculated strategic steps to reduce our own survival risk. Um, Michael Csikszentmihalyi's famous work on flow and the psychology of happiness, he managed to show that all things being equal, when you put innovators side by side and give them the same education, the same financial opportunities, uh, the same abilities and, you know, everything else. What sorts out the great ones is their motivation to help others. 
Anyway, when we're doing this in innovation, when I do it with the team, what we do now is we put everything on the table. Everything we have, everything we know, everything we can do. It's just like at the start of learning any skill as a kid as well. You have to put in all your time and energy. Your parents put in all their money. And um, yeah, we do this just to get involved before we even know where we're really headed. And then one day we look around and we start to ask what's really happening um, because now we're about five or six years old and we're asking a lot of questions and um, this stage I call the stage of discipline it builds on generosity um, because actually for the first time now we're becoming aware that ourselves we as an actor and the actions that we do have consequences and we become very exact about what is our relationship and how do we interact and realize that we're not independent, we're interdependent. And as innovators at this step, we ask a lot of questions, we do surveys, we try to say what's going on, we collect information, we collect data. And uh, we try to find the most important problem that needs solving, the thing that's affecting everybody and uh, that yeah, hasn't been solved yet. So what it also means is we make a hundred hypotheses. What should we do? What could we do? We change our mind a hundred times and it looks like a waste of time to companies who want a fast track to innovation. But obviously it's not because we have to assume that human creativity is not in question the same way that human generosity is not in question. We can always find an answer. It doesn't matter what the problem is. But so what if we're not answering the right question? A couple of years ago, I met one of the founders of Dropbox in Silicon Valley and I was quite chuffed to find that investors take this step seriously because as I heard his story um, talking about some little data storage problem that nobody seemed to care very much about, I realized investors care about people who get down and dirty, who jump into that mess of questions that everyone else is ignoring or maybe even doesn't see. And investors back the people who take such problems personally. Now, the innovators among you will know that once we have figured out more or less what's the core problem and which direction should we go, then Pandora's box will open and all the evils of the world will be unleashed and um, we'll be chased by demons and monsters and everything that can go wrong will go wrong at this step and we'll feel like we've fallen into the belly of a whale and we can't get out and we've failed our mission already and we've only just started. That's quite normal too. We're now at the age of seven to ten, learning how to problem solve and starting to connect the dots, put together um, the information we gathered in the previous steps, starting to understand what it's really going to take to reach our goals. And when we use the map in an innovation exercise formally, what we do here is we try to preempt the problems that we might cause by actually achieving our results or, or our wishes from the previous step. So what we need to do here is um, actually figure out the contradiction that's built into this step, um, which is that we want to balance the things that we need to want to create on the one hand and everything that's going to go wrong or get destroyed on the other. And this is inextricably, inextricably linked and so all my clients hate this step. It's not easy, it's not fun. It's frustrating and emotionally debilitating to feel like the suffering will never end, which is exactly how it feels. <laughs> but Passing this test requires what Daniel Coyle called deep practice, I think, yeah, deep practice. It's the willingness to go deliberately into the pain, slowly and repeatedly, until we get it right, until we get over it. And um, needless to say, this is an important step, strategic step for innovators that we would all like to ignore. I mean, how many of us really have the patience to tolerate delays and frustrations without getting annoyed or anxious or giving up. But if we don't, this, as I said, is the step where the proverbial will hit the fan. And uh, if we don't have patience, would-be innovators will give up. So the next step contradicts this one yet again, because finally our problems are over. Here we're unleashed, we're shooting for the stars, meeting the goddess, uh, you know, seeing all these beautiful idea butterflies floating around. It's the stereotypical stage of idea generation or brainstorming. We're now 12 years old and we're competent to apply and test all the things that we learned in the previous steps. Uh, we want to now build a social fabric. We're busy discovering and communicating with people who are on a path towards goals similar to ours. 
People who are okay with calling themselves creative love this step. Uh, they get all enthusiastic and eager, even though there's still a lot of effort involved. People who pride themselves more on logic don't like it quite so much because it's also quite natural to get overwhelmed by all the competing stimuli we have to deal with, all the data. And uh, it's also easy to get annoyed because we never find whole answers, only fragments. We can't see a whole picture yet. So I always try and make a game of this step for corporates and for kids. Inevitably, 11-year-olds still come up to me afterwards and say, it's not really a game, is it? <laughs> and that's because they have to hold so much stuff in their working memory that it's quite hard work before lunch. But that's actually what's happening here, and, and this is really where we see the hallmark of creativity. It's that putting together of all the sensory information and overloading it, um, all this newness, and trying to integrate it with our long-term memory um, that increases our intelligence, as well as helps us with innovation, actually has been proven to be the best way to raise IQ. And at the same time, if we don't get frustrated, if we can relax into it, what also happens is we get so busy, well actually our parietal lobes get so busy processing everything, that we lose sense of ourselves and we have this expanded sense of being part of everything and you know, it can be cosmic and spiritual and wonderful. And people come up to me afterwards and always say, wow, that's where the magic happens. So that's a good step, that one. Okay. Oh, it's gone one too far. How did that happen? I hope that was showing what I was talking about. Anyway, um, once we've found all of these fantastic ideas, I mean, it's a given, no matter how fantastic they are, that we can't use all of them. And uh, at some point, developmentally, uh, we have to really level up a huge step. So this step here, it does say meditation, but what it really means is concentration on an ideal form. And what's going to happen here as innovators and as learners is that we do something the equivalent of, well, we change from just playing piano or learning how to compose for a single instrument to now finally creating a concerto for 100 instruments or putting together a band and figuring out how to make it in the music industry. And so um, what we have to do here is analyse, categorise, figure out what's useful from everything that we've now got. We need to put the fragments together, uh, the threads, and work out systems, not just parts. And when we're doing that, hopefully, uh, we'll figure out that we're in some kind of teenager phase, engaged in blissful productivity. We'll be really maxed out with all the decisions we have to make that define our own identity, as well as the brand and mission and vision of the product, and of course, the form of the ideal world that we now know that we want to build. So, now we're up to wisdom. Mm. Now, if the previous step was about holding on to form, which is what I was trying to imply, then this step is about letting go, our fourth contradiction. And um, we let go because we're grown up and we're now ready and able to evaluate just a handful of really crucial options, but in the blink of an eye, easily. And in this step, we are faced with what I call three fates, uh, or three gatekeepers, a trinity of innovation that my research shows underlies all our organisations, every human organisation, and it also organizes, uh, underlies the organisation of, well, I think the world in general. And the reason I say this is because there's a rule keeper, a rule maker, and a rule breaker. There's structure, there's flexibility, and there's something new in the middle. And I say this also because we know that great innovators are always experts in their own domain first. They are masters of it, they keep the rules perfectly. And then at some point, they find something new and bring that in and it breaks the rules. Or they just do it for the hell of it, I don't know. Either way, they keep the rules, they break the rules at the right time, to the right degree. And that's what makes history. Now, they also do this effortlessly. They do it in a way that looks intuitive to everybody else. And I think that, um, you know, great innovators talk about finding answers in dreams and coincidences because their instrument is the mind. And it's the same sort of thing as when a pianist would say the sonata played itself, or maybe a tennis pro would say the ball hit itself over the net. I think what they're all talking about is what Michal Csikszentmihalyi called flow, 
and which in Buddhism is called wisdom. Now this is a level of surgical precision that's completely divorced from our own emotions and from our own desires about how things should be. It's a level of doing stuff perfectly. And that should bring us to the final step, the level of mastery and excellence and skill that uh, is our epic win, what Jane McGonigal calls an outcome that's so positive, we never really believed we could do it, and then are totally shocked to find out that we actually did get there. And as you know, my epic quest was to find a way to make the world unbroken. And I promised you seven contradictions, I've only shown you four. So let me show you the final three and then my bonus secret. Um, first, you see the shape of the whole map is actually like an eye. Um, this is because we do with our mind what our eyes do with space. So when we're focusing on a goal um, at a point on the horizon, it's like zero degrees, we're actually getting two sets of mismatched spatial information coming to the left and right retina at the same time. And that's our fifth contradiction. But of course, if we're not focusing on a goal, if we open, open up to see the field of all possibilities, 180 degrees, uh, something similar is happening. Still two contradictory streams of information, our sixth contradiction. And then the miracle of all miracles is that both of these things are happening at once in our mind's eye, and our mind is putting this information together without us even noticing. So I end up thinking, well, okay, contradiction and duality are built into us as human beings. We can't escape them. But what we can escape is making an either-or situation of them. And um, because we know that with our senses, this is how we get all our richness. We get three dimensions, perspective and depth, you know, our eyes, our ears, everything we touch. What if we could get the same joy by putting stuff together like that with our mind? Which is pretty much what Buddhist masters have always said anyway. I think they like to say that reality is actually not broken. It just looks that way if we're not paying attention. And so that brings me to my bonus thing, which is that I am really privileged and honoured to work with Thay Dorje, who is the 17th Galois Kamapa. And we are putting ancient wisdom in a modern context that we hope will be useful for education, precisely because it doesn't require meditation or it doesn't require anybody to be Buddhist. And so what that means is the map that I just showed you is not actually just the result of my scientific research. And it's not just a map for innovation and it's not just a map that revisions Bloom's taxonomy for education. And it's not even just all the steps of the hero's journey in Hollywood when you know he goes through all the obstacles, slays the dragon, gets the girl, makes his wonderful kingdom, even though it is all of those things. What this map is, um, is actually the steps to become what Buddhists call a hero of mind. Um, what this map actually is, is the steps to enlightenment.